Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. You're going to open up with me to uh, Mark 11. And I think I'll start there. We've been talking about faith. And so I thought I... I thought about, I said a few weeks ago about mental assenting and what's real faith. And so the Spirit of God draw, drew me back to this, and I was just meditating, and this came out of my spirit. And so I feel a little bit led to, to uh, talk about it, and so that you might begin to understand the difference between faith and mental assenting. Like, I believe this is the Word of God, but I mentally agree to that. But do I put it to practice? Do I put it to my life? Do I... Do I stand on it? Do I let it guide my path and direct me and enlighten me as I walk? For the first few years of my Christian walk, I'd have to say I don't even know what that meant. But now as I grow in Christ, it's interesting how much he becomes a part of your life as you begin to process that. But real faith is taking the Word of God, taking God's promise and applying it to your life and just standing on his Word. And we'll continue to talk about that later, not today. But Turn with me to Mark 11, 11, verse 22 there. Jesus had the God kind of life. Remember, that's a command. It's in the present. It means make it a part of your character. Make it a part of your behavior. Make it a part of everyday life. Know that you can apply God's faith in any situation you enter in, not only in your spiritual walk, but in your marriage, raising your kids, your education, your work, whatever you want to apply God to. And that's kind of what that means there. The present means just generally uh, apply it to your life in every situ situation. Verily I say unto you that whosoever say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast, and she shall not doubt. Now, Romans 4 says staggering. James 1 says wavering. The word in the Greek is diakrino. It means to change your mouth by what you speak. And so... And I want you to hold on to that. Then it goes on, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. Ye shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And, and then there's Kai and, verse 25, and. When you're standing, in other words, when you're absolutely standing Believing God for a situation in your life, and you're speaking the promise of God at that moment, right there and then. It goes on and says, You have ought against any that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. That's pretty bold. And so God said here, you have to forgive like I forgive. True forgiveness in the Greek is you dismiss something or you let it go to never return. So when you mental assent to the word of God, here's the difference between mental assenting and faith. If I said to someone, oh, I have forgiven you, and then all of a sudden you see them walking down the street and you see them and you go, that son of a bee, that something, and anger comes up and th bad thoughts come up. You just mental assent it to the word of God. You did not forgive that person. True forgiveness never picks it back up in their mouth. The mountain, whatever it was that caused that disturbance between both of you, God's word, you said, I believe God's promise but then when the pressure was on, when the mountain got darker, when the situation starts to squeeze you, instead of speaking God's promise, let us hold on to the confession of our hope. That hope is God's promise. You have to speak God's promise right at that moment. You got to look at that squeezing. You got to look at that mountain. You got to look at that circumstance. And instead of speaking what you're feeling, feeling what you're seeing, what you're sensing, what you're thinking, what you're reasoning, what you're logic. Instead of all that, you've got to speak the word of God. You call those things that be not as being. You've got to call God's promise into motion. So here he said faith. I mean, forgiveness. And so I just want to go off on this just for a moment. 
there's three types of forgiveness in the Word of God. There's how God forgives you, and you have to accept that. And then there's you have to forgive yourself. And I found a lot of times in a, in a person that's been pretty wretched or lived a pretty uh, rotten life, so to speak, uh, did things that they're now maybe ashamed of, uh, they have a hard time forgiving themselves. And the third area is forgiving one another. If something comes up between you, uh, you grab each other, you say, you know, I'm really sorry, forgive me. But I just want to show you for a moment how God looks at that, because he told me to do this, so I'm going to do it. In Hebrews chapter 8, and it's interesting that this is in right with the faith message. So we talked about having your faith privately before you and God. Uh, we also talked about respect of persons can, can hurt your faith. And now he's saying that if we don't forgive, it hurts our faith. Because I hear all the time, why didn't God answer my prayer? And then when I'm with you from out, that son of a dog, look what he did to me or what they did to me. Well, right there, you just mentally said your faith can't work. So I'm just trying to give you some ideas of how faith works and how faith operates. And so everything like forgiveness, I thought this was awesome. It works really a lot like faith. So you can either speak your hurt, you can speak the circumstance of the situation, or you can speak what God said, let it go and not speak it. If you pick it back up in your mouth, you truly have not forgiven someone. You said, oh, I'll forget, but it's almost like that saying, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. And you got to understand that when God forgives you, he does not remember it no more. It will never come into his thought life, and it will never come into his mouth. He will never speak to you. Because I think about this, you take the uh, life of Abram, we call him Abraham now, that he struggled with taking the promise of God and applying it to his life. 24 years he kept circling back to Bethel, the house of God. He'd come to the altar, he'd tell God, his situation and God would tell him again over and over and over his promise I will give you a seed and so it took Abraham 24 years to process God's promise and apply it to his life because he only mentally assented to it because every time he felt discouraged or every time he saw a young man that it wasn't his he said you've given me gold you've given me silver you've given me cattle you've given me sheep you've given me camels you've given me donkeys you've given me men servants maids i have so much i can't take anymore i'm a multi-millionaire but where's my seed where's my son see he just mentally agreed to the promise of god where's my son well i promise you you will have a son and so abram changed his name to abram saying my father of many nations calling those things be not as being then he had a son within a year but the thing is, when God talked about Abraham in Romans chapter 4, it said he never staggered at the word of God. He never staggered at the promise of God. What? <laughs> we just read six, seven chapters of how he wavered, how he staggered, how he doubted. But see, when God forgives you, he remembers it no more. He don't talk about it. When he talked about Abraham in Romans 4, he's the father of our faith he's the natural father of our faith he, in other words he he was the originator god dealt with him about faith and he birthed it into the natural realm for us when he talked about abraham he said he never wavered he never he never staggered what <laughs> i mean he cautiously went to god and, and complained where his son was and god cautiously came back and said i promised you a seed and i'm not changing he tried to make his servant the son he tried to make the hand the handmaid of of sarah birth a seed and called him his son and God said no I told you out of your own loins there will come a seed and so when you say that you forgive somebody and you pick that back up in your mouth and you speak your unforgiveness you just mentally assent it to the word of God and I thought this was a good example I don't know if the spirit of God put it in there for this example or not because we all struggle with human nature there's not a person in this room that hadn't had someone that just irritated you or you just wanted to go out and punch them in the nose. Or you want to do something rotten to them like they did rotten to you. And don't tell me you have it. You're not perfect. You're not holy. Amen. Even Jesus struggled with this. Amen. He on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 8, uh, it says this. It's talking about the covenant we entered into. And it says in verse uh, 10, of chapter 8 of Hebrews 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. What days? After the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now God cut blood with us through the death of his son. He shed his blood. That's how you make covenant. Some would slice their palms. Some would do their wrists. Some would drop it in the wine. Others would just uh, join their wrists together. However, the blood was bound or mixed together, which meant a covenant. And in that covenant, you would give them everything you have. They're, they're right. They're closer to you than your own hus uh, wife or husband. You will fight for them to death. You'll be with them to the end of their life, no matter what situation. And covenant is a beautiful thing. We have not really taught that in America, what covenant really means. So when you accept Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed, it means that everything God has is now yours. Everything that God can do, is, you can do. And it's an awesome covenant. So in this covenant, I will make with the house of after those days, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I will put my word into their mind and write them into their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be, be a people. And they shall not teach, they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. That's how they did it in Israel. The father would teach his son. Then that son will grow into a father, and he'd have a son, and he would teach it. They kept passing it down to generation to generation. But in this new covenant, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will, never, I will remember no more. Now, in the Greek, that's two negatives, u and me. It'll either be a future or a subjunctive. What does that all mean? It just means I will never, ever, 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 ever remind you of what you've done. I don't know how good you think that is, but if you've done some really bad things in your life, that's nice to know that maybe they won't forgive you here on this earth for what you've done, but for eternity, God will never bring it up to your face, and he will love you just like he loved Jesus Christ. He will love you just like he loves his own son. That's a good thing to know. Amen? And so over in 10, remember in confirmation, at least two is is a witness so in chapter 10 he brings it up again under the spirit and this starts around uh, 16 15 says wherefore the Holy Ghost also is witness to us for after that he had said before this is the covenant I will make with them after those days the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ say Lord I will put my laws in their hearts write their minds my, uh, uh, write in their minds I will write them and their sins and iniquities I remember no more so where no remission of sin is there is no more offering for sin and so I want you to see that when you mentally assent to the word of God, that sin will come back up or that unforgiveness will come up and you'll speak it. And God's just showing you that you really are not walking in faith. You're walking how you mentally agree to the word of God. And so it'll carry over into your faith life. If I'm believing God for, let's say, healing, and I go to the doctors and it said, guess what? It got worse. I'm only giving you eight months to live. I mean, that's devastating when you hear stuff like that. But God's word said, you're healed by my stripes. Ye were healed. At that moment is the mountain. And you've got to speak to the mountain. You've got to hold on to the confession of your hope. What is the confession of your hope? God's promise. Because it's not faith yet. You're birthing faith into your life. So you've got to hold on to God's promise because... God's promise or hope, faith is the substance of the things you hope for and the evidence of things you have not seen. So at that moment, you're not seeing your healing. You're just seeing your mountain of sickness and disease. You're hearing the reports. You're seeing it, uh, filling it in your body. You, you, it's, just, it's all around you. It's, it's in your thoughts. It's in everyday life. It's 24-7. You can't escape from it. But at that moment, you're either going to doubt, waver, or stagger or are you going to speak God's word? What's God's word? The promise that he gave you. you got to look at that mountain no matter how dark and bleak it gets. You either speak God's promise at that moment. Because if you pick up the circumstance and speak it, you only mentally ascend it to the word of God. And a double-minded man receives nothing of the Lord. And so there's a lot of discouraged Christians because they have not been taught the principles of faith. So they thought, well, I, I, I quoted the word of God. I, I, I spoke it. I know someone that got healed by the power of God. I've seen the testimony of their own life. I know they've been healed. 
but I, I guess it's not for me. See, right there, you just mentally assent it to the Word of God. And so God uses their forgiveness. Because I think every person in, in this room has to deal with somebody or a situation in your life that you might have caused or somebody caused to you. And so you first have to let God forgive you. Second, you have to learn to forgive yourself. And then third, you have to forgive your brother or sister. Let's look at that at Colossians. And he told me to do this, so I'm just following what the Spirit of God said. In Colossians chapter 3, in verse 13, it says, Forgiving, forbearing one another, enduring with one another. You know, sometimes you have to endure with somebody. Somebody that might be doing you wrong. Somebody that might be talking about behind your back. Somebody that has a switchblade in your back. I mean, I mean, life goes on. You have to endure with these things. And then it goes on and says, If any man have a quarrel against any, Christ forgave you, so you do also. So when you forgive somebody, you don't pick it up in your mouth again. God will never, ever, 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 ever bring to your attention what you have asked him to forgive you of. And you're to respond to him as a son and walk in his likeness. And so you have to also recognize that you also have to never, ever, 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 ever mention it. you got to let it go. Forgiveness really means to let it go. It means to dismiss it. Let it go. Cover it under the blood of Jesus. And let it go. It goes on and says, As Christ forgave you, so do you also. And above all these, put on love. Let the peace, 15, rule in your heart. Because over in Matthew, Peter said to Jesus, How many times do I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus went on and said, No, 70 times seven. In one day. You know, if I wanted to irritate my wife and do something to her 490 times, I think I'm purposely doing that. <laughs> you know? I'm being rude. And so... But in life, if you make a mistake over and over, just know that God will continue to forgive you. There's no ending to his love in, in the power of forgiveness. But you have to also understand that he's expecting you to forgive like he forgave you. You're to forgive them. Remember the story of the guy, oh, millions of dollars. And he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ and he begs on the mercy of God to forgive him. So God forgives him of his a million dollar debt. He goes out and he sees a man that owes him money, ten dollars and fifty cents. He takes that man and says, "Pay me the debt you owe me." He shakes him, puts him into prison. He tells him, "I'm going to take your wife, your children, all your possessions. You give back to everything that you owe me." The servants go back and they tell the Lord what this man did, and he comes to them and says, "Why did you do that? I've forgiven you of millions." And you can't forgive someone at ten dollars? He said, I'm gonna cast you over. Listen, I'm gonna cast you over to torment. What that means in unforgiveness, it torments your thoughts. Every time you see that person, it, it rises up and it's not good. You don't want to be around them, you don't want to talk to them, you don't want to share the same room. You don't even want to be near them. And God said, We're to forgive like He forgives. Remember, this will affect your faith. It's amazing. Respect a person's will affect your faith. Unforgiveness will affect your faith. And so, because a lot of times I hear Christians, well, I know I'm standing on the Word of God, but it's just not coming to pass. Check up on some things. Check up on some things. Amen? Because God doesn't change. He's the same. So the problem's at my end, not his end. And so you ask the Spirit of God. You come in and you plead with them. It says in Isaiah 43, 29, come in and plead with them. Come in and plead with them. Say, God, I can't, I can't take this. I don't understand, blah, 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 blah. Lay it out. But give a moment for God to speak back to you. And then it goes on, let the peace of God rule in your heart to which you are called into one body. Listen to this. Let the word, it's a command, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teach them all this in one another, the psalms, hymns, and spiritual song. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatever you do, do in the name of Jesus. Notice the very next verse, and you'll find this every time that you're in the presence of God, then the word submission comes. Why is that? Because flesh has a hard time submitting to one another. If I'm struggling with somebody, 
and I'm in the flesh, and I don't know about you, my flesh comes out. But if I can keep myself over into the Spirit, let the Word of Christ, the Word that Jesus placed in my spirit through reading and meditation, and the Holy Spirit takes that Word and speaks it back to me, that's the Word of Christ. When He speaks that back to you, you follow that out. Well, that, that talking will dry up if you don't get out of unforgiveness. It will stop till you deal with what God wants you to deal with. Now, watch this. It goes on. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you what? Richly, not poorly. So, again, how much time have you spent in the Word of God meditating, not just on what you need, but just meditating on Him? Just like if I pulled in once a week for a quickie with my wife, that's not going to happen. I got to be there 24 <laughs> 7. It works. That's just the way it works. And so sometimes we just want to pull into God and have a quickie. God, you said in your word, you'll do this, but if you don't, that's not a big deal. I go on. Well, what would you do if your son only came around once a month and asked for something? Every time you see him, ask for you for something. Next time you see him come and you lock the doors and act like turn the lights off and say you're not home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, if we're made in the image of God, what do you think he's thinking? He's going to shut down the throne, man. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. No, I'm just kidding now. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. All wisdom, teach him awesome one of psalms, hymns, spiritual song, singing with grace in your heart. The song Susan sang, he was out of her spirit. You can't find that with a CCL license and a number because she didn't propose it in to get money every time someone sings it because God gave it to her out of a situation in a moment of her life that God birthed that in her spirit to get through a storm maybe or whatever she was facing that's the purpose of putting the word of God into your spirit because it will minister to you if you get God in you God can move for you and I want to show you this all right and he told me to tell you about submission if you're struggling with a wife or a husband, don't go to him when you're in the flesh. Try this out. Get over into the spirit and then talk. You know, we, uh, I was brought up in a European home, a mountain mom. <laughs> she was rough. Love her dearly now. I wrote her a letter last year and apologized for the messes I made. Ruined how many birthdays and Christmases. I could go on and on and on, but I want to. And so, um, I don't want to get off on that. I'll go on. But it's harder if you're going to go to that person in the flesh. Flesh is going to come out. You have to learn to get yourself over into the spirit. Once you get over the spirit, it's easier to submit to somebody. It's either to correct things with somebody. It's either to walk with somebody. You got to make them wrong. Just as Christ forgave you, you're to forgive. And remember, if you only mental assent to that, that means when you see that person or somebody mentions that person or the devil brings it back to your thought life, what does that do in you? Does it take away your peace and you're ready to punch them in the nose? You just mentally assent it to the Word of God. Because the battle is going to come and it's going to come back to your mind. Let's look at some of this, all right? Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, and I think this is one of the greatest needs that's in the body of Christ today. Amen? In Romans chapter 12, it says, Be not conformed to this rule. God's saying through the Spirit, we pattern our life and form our way of life after the world. Your finances. Let me give you an example. In our country, you're allowed to retire to 65. At 65, you can retire. I mean, I've seen men, I mean, they get up every morning, 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, work a good 8, 10 hours. As soon as they retire, next thing I know, they're on a walker and a cane. You know, they're talking about death. Why? Because the real tells you it's over. No, it's not. Abraham started at 75. Moses started his ministry at 80. Caleb took his mountain at 80. He's swinging a sword like he did at age 40. 
Are you walking around like you did at age 40? Are you walking around? Oh, my God. Why? Because the world told you you should be like that. Well, God never told you that. Who told you that? Who told you that? Because you've got to learn as we get into this, hopefully today, that the word renew actually means to make younger. So I got a hold of that when I studied that. At first, me and Brenda just got married. I said, honey, look at this. We grow older every day, but we can stay younger. So we started to confess that over our life. I went into a restaurant one time. We were around 30, 34 years old. Brenda was licensed. Do you have a license, honey? <laughs> no, she really is older than 18. You know what I'm saying? But it's amazing that the Spirit of God can make you young again. Because, see, I have friends that did a lot of narcotics and alcohol, and they look like it. They're hard. Look like life beat them up. Their fresh face looks stressed. Some of them are red. You know? All that beating they did to their organs. It's paying out the price. But you get born again, you can start reversing that process. He can start making you look young again. He can put uh, a little color back in your cheeks. He can make you feel young again. He can make you feel like getting out of bed and running around. You know what I'm saying? He can give you strength. Just renewing, just reading the Word of God. Just reading His Word. Just fellowshipping with the Word of God. It's fellowshipping with Jesus. And in God's presence, that Spirit of God will minister to your physical man also. He's there for your spirit, soul, body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray your whole body, spirit, soul, and body. Be whole. Be whole that as I created. Man, did you ever read when they first came out of the Spirit of God? They lived to 900 years. We've been told we're only allowed to live to 70. That's a lie. God said you can have up to 120. Amen? If you get to 70 and you're not satisfied, ask for 10 more, the psalm said. If you get to 80 and you're not satisfied, ask for 10 more. Some people get satisfied. Brenda's dad got satisfied. He said, I don't want to go on. I don't want to. Uh-uh, I'm done. He made that choice. Paul said, I'm in a choice between two, to go home or stay. Eventually, you'll have that choice. It's up to you if you want to go on or not. God will give you 10 more years. But the Spirit of God, just by reading the Word of God, will bring that tenderness of youngness and that health and that strength back to you, to your life. Amen. Do not be conformed to this world. Pattern your life after what this world thinks. The God of this world order is Satan now. And his forming knowledge is called the knowledge of good and evil. You have done good things in your life, and you've done evil things in your life. But God's life, God's tree, is life. Zoe. The abundance of life within your spirit. Get a hold of it. It'll make you feel good. Amen. Then it goes on, but be transformed. You know what the word transform there means? Now everybody uses an example about a caterpillar becoming the monarch. Going in the cocoon and breaking out as a butterfly. That's kind of what it means. But it's the way that God pertained to you to change. Are you listening to this? To change the character of your being and the condition of your life. When's God going to change the condition of your life? When you renew your mind in the Word of God. When you start to think the way God thinks. When you start to pattern and form your life after Him. And the way He thinks and the way He moves and the way He speaks. Calling those things that be not as, as being. He said about sin and unforgiveness. I'll remember it never, 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 never again. Well, I mentioned it to you. Amen? I shared this story. I went home for Christmas. Brenda said, I missed the family. Let's go home. And we haven't been home for a while. And my brothers and sister were there. For some reason, we're all gathered around that year at Christmas like we used to when we were younger. And uh, it didn't take long to the self-righteous ones started to ask me, why did I mess up the family? <laughs> and they ate me up. I just couldn't wait to find a door and get out of there. Why in the world did I come home? Isn't it good when we go to heaven, God's never going to bring up anything that you did? 
Because my family, they, they know I, I accepted Jesus Christ. I even asked them to forgive me. But guess what? They just, they don't let it go. <laughs> I mean, it had to come out. I don't have no answers for that kind of stuff. I just don't. I think it was a path to destroy my life, so I'd never enter into ministry, to be quite frank with you. But anyway, it goes on. It says, by the renewing of your mind. How are you going to change the condition of your body, condition of your circumstances, the condition of your marriage, the condition of the ways and kids, condition of anything? How am I going to change my character? Because it seems like every time I get around this person, I want to kill them. <laughs> I want to get angry. It takes the process of renewing your mind. I want to show you one other thing, then you know uh, proof what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And the last perfect there I like because it says you can be, begin to walk with God as an adult, as perfect and fully uh, capable of living life out the way God designs you to walk it out. Amen? But it's a process. This process is shown in the Word of God as stages of growth. I have yet never seen anybody born into the world 22 years old. Why? It's still coming, honey. Push. It's still coming, honey. It's still coming, honey. It's still coming. Six foot and eight inches. Woo! His, his head would be poking out of her mouth. Hi, Mom. But some reason we get born again and we think we're already an adult. Things of the natural image is the things of the spirit. It takes time to grow. The next stage is youth. The next stage is an adult. So we start to begin to see the stages of maturity here. The good, the 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 acceptable <laughs> and perfect will of God. Now, one other thing, go with me to Titus and hold your finger here if you want. In Titus, this is a pastor, these are called pastoral epistles. In chapter 3 of verse 5, listen to this. It said, not by works of righteousness which we have done. And I've been in denominations and I'm familiar with other religions that believe your only way to get to heaven is by works. We believe the only way to heaven is accepting Jesus Christ on what he did on the cross. He became sin for us. He went into hell for us. He went into God's presence for us. And he sent us to comfort her on the same day. Amen. I will not leave you comfortless. Which we have done. Well, up to I met Jesus, my works weren't really good. The only thing that was good in my life was I showed up to work on time every time they asked me and my word if my word was no good I figured I'd be no good and so I worked very hard that my word meant something and I was so uh, Brenna says I'm OC or something I was so OC on that I'd even call and start telling them why I couldn't and they said that's alright brother it's alright you know it's okay so people have problems but uh oh when you see the word but, it means total opposite. If it's Allah, it means it's strong contrast. If it's de, it means a small contrast. It's not, not as big. I didn't look to see which one this was, but I imagine it's Allah. <laughs> but, and that's my opinion. That, I didn't look at the word. But according to his mercy, because before you can get his grace, you've got to have his mercy. What does mercy there mean? He's going to do something for you even if you don't deserve it. Are you listening to me? All I brought to Jesus was a mess. But because of his mercy, then I could receive his grace. By faith are you saved through grace. Amen? Think about this. You've got to come to mercy first. Somewhere you've got to sit down and say, God, I'm at a mess. I'm not asking you to love me. I'm just asking you to have mercy on me. Amen. I remember a story. There was two, a minister, and the speed limits were changing. They're growing uh, slower. And so he had a heavy foot. And so he's coming through town. <laughs> so state copper pulls him over, and he gives him a ticket. So he goes to the court, and he said to the judge, he said, Judge, I know I did wrong. I know I broke the speed limit. I'm not asking you. I'm not being stupid here. 
but I'm asking for mercy. I'm asking for mercy that somehow the court, because I was on an emergency call, that through mercy you might forgive me. The judge said, is that in the word of God? And they started at the word of God, and he said, you know what? I'll let you go. We come to God only through his mercy, through the burial, death, and resurrection of our, our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. Now watch what it says here. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Here's what that means. Regeneration means to be born. Born from above. Jesus said there's two births. There's a natural birth and there's a spiritual birth. So what he's saying here is that through the Spirit, not of your works, but on the works of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, you can have regeneration. You can be born of the Spirit. Then notice there it says the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So what that means is there's an operation that took place when you said, Jesus, come into my heart. The Spirit of God came on you and into you, removed out of you that nature of sin, and that fruit of spiritual death, separation from God, and he replaced it with a seed, the seed of God, the nature of God, Christ, the wisdom and power of God. He replaced it into your spirit. You have in your spirit, sealed into you, 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, Ephesians 1, 13, 2 Corinthians 5, 5. In that sealment, you have a measure of God's anointing that will supply everything you need, not only this life, but the next. Or you could translate it this way. He's put within you all the wisdom and power of himself in you to contain you in your spiritual walk and your natural walk. But what's happened is we, we've never known how to draw that up out of our spirit. You have contained in you, there's no respect of persons, the same thing Jesus Christ had in his spirit, you have. That's hard to take, isn't it? He emptied his glory. He became like you and I. Now, when it comes to ministry, it's different. He was, met, he was anointed without measure. We only receive measures. But in the new birth, you have the same thing, the divine nature of God in you. And what did Jesus, they wanted to stone him for? Calling him Father. When did God become your Father? When you accepted Jesus Christ. His son, you asked him to come in your heart. At that moment, you were grafted in. You were born of the Spirit. He now becomes your father. He places within you everything you need. But it's dormant. It's laying inside your spirit. It's a spiritual operation. I put it this way. When I accepted Jesus Christ, I weighed about 112 pounds. When I come out on the other side, I still 112 pounds. I had blonde hair, blue eyes. I was going to say something. But when I was after born again, I still had blonde hair and blue eyes. My thoughts never changed. What changed was my spirit. What changed was my inner man. He took out of me that nature of sin, that separation of God, and put within me his divine nature. I was partakers of his divine nature. I got regenerated. I got renewed in my spirit by the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Second Peter, he wants me to go there first, so we'll go there first, Second Peter. In Second Peter, look at this in verse 3. According as his divine power is given unto us all things obtained in life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, to his presence and to his anointing power. Wherefore are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by what? The promises of God. God's promises. God's spoken word. Thea Panuma. God's spoken word. God spoke these promises out of his own spirit and they were recorded by man. That thy these you might be partakers of the divine nature. How? The divine nature, that anointing of Christ. The Spirit of God is already sealed into your spirit, but it won't do no effect to you till you partake of it. Okay, I'm hungry. And in my cabinet is canned goods, like vegetables. We don't. We can our own, but I'm just using. In the freezer, I have meat. I have potatoes in the sack, and I'm starving. 
And somebody comes in and says, why are you so hungry? I don't know. And they open the cabinet, and they open the freezer, and they open up the refrigerator and say, man, you've got tons of food. Well, that food's doing me no good unless I partake of it. God's placed in you everything you need of all the wisdom and power to carry you not in your spiritual life and natural life, but you've got to partake of it. And how do I partake it? Through the exceeding precious promises of God's word. On God's promises, he will allow you to partake of what he has given you as an inheritance to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But what do we do? We waver at our circumstance and we say, oh my God, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know. Why does God keep doing this? Why does this circumstance keep coming back? Why do I got to keep facing these things? Blah, 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 blah. Well, if you quit wavering, if you keep staggering and keep from uh, doubting, what you need to do is begin to speak the promise of God, partake through the word of God and speak it to that mountain. Now, what happens in that let me finish this verse. You're partakers of the divine nature of God having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. In 1 John we read that when I'm born again, he places that seed within me. It says this, verse 9, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That's talking about the Spirit of God in you. For God's seed remains in you. Galatians 3.16. I just want you to get a hold of this. In Galatians 3.16, that seed is Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.24, Christ is the wisdom of God and power of God. And I'll just show you one, 2 Corinthians. It says this, you have been established. All the promises of God are yes or true. Verse 21, he has established you in Christ. How did he establish me in Christ? He exchanged my nature's sin for his divine nature. That's called the new birth. That's being born of the Spirit. He places within me Christ, the seed of God. I've now partaken of the divine nature of God. But where is it? It said, and has anointed me. That's anointing in you. He has sealed. That means it's in you. It's sealed. No one can break that seal. That's why the devil never plays with your spirit. He plays with your mind. And I'll show you that. Not probably today. Has given us an earnest amount, a measure of the Holy Spirit in our heart. You have deep inside you everything you have, the wisdom and the power of God. Listen to what Paul learned. It took him a time, but he learned it. This is out of Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. That word crucified means I'm identified with Christ. I'm identified with God's wisdom. I'm identified with God's power. Not the mountain. The mountain will kill you. The mountain will destroy you. But whenever you learn that you got the same measure of the Holy Ghost inside your spirit as Jesus did, you can rise up to that great storm and say, Peace be! And there will be a great calm. What manner of man is this? A man or a man that got a hold of God's promises, learned who he was in Christ, and began to walk it out in his life. No longer am I I'm crucified, Grand never I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. The wisdom and power of God lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Back to Romans 12. I'm not going to be able to get too far here. Man, I went fast. In Romans 12, it says, Be not formed or patterned after this world order. Satan is the God of this world order. All right, Lord, let me look at our in the middle of the sea. All right. Thank you, Lord. All right, all right, all right. All right, now, it says here, it says, be, but be you transformed. You slowly change your character. You can change how you look at a person. You can either hate them or through the word of God begin to change that character about you and begin to love them like God loves them. Pray for them that what? Persecuted you. Do good to them that harmed you. What do we do? Look for the next opportunity. We can get back even. 
<laughs> That's flesh. Renew your mind. That word, renew, is the same thing that happened in Titus. When you were born again, God took... This is my last thought. We'll close. When you were born again, God took His Spirit and did a spiritual operation on your spirit. He took out of you that nature of sin and death that was passed down to you. He exchanged it. You became a new creature in Christ. You went from death to light, darkness to light, death to life. There's a natural change there. You were lost, but now you're found. You were dead, but you're alive. And I want you to see here, that took place when you said, Jesus, come into my heart. It was done that fast. And he pre-designed you in the womb. We, we sang that this morning, didn't we? In the womb of, of my mother, God formed me. And now, when I'm born again, he comes into the womb of my spirit and forms me into his image. That image is Christ, the wisdom and power of God. But it doesn't affect my life at all. All I know at that point is I'm forgiven of my sins and my name's written in the book of life. But when I walk out the front door, I still face the same circumstances. They don't change. God, why won't you help me in my circumstances? God, won't you help me with my mouth? God, where are you? <laughs> He's in you. But now you got to take that same operation and begin to renew your mind. The same renewal that happened in your spirit was done by the Spirit of God. But now you're responsible to take it to the next level. It's you and God walking together. So what you do is you take promises that deal with the circumstance or the situation that you want to change or your character or your nature you want to change. So you take the Word of God and you start to meditate on it. What begins to happen is the Spirit of God that's in you will begin to take that same renewal that happened to your spirit and begin to change your thoughts to the way God wants you to think. Because He don't want you to walk like the world walks. He, don't want, he wants you to separate from the world and draw unto Him and He'll draw nigh unto you. Now, you don't deny that you're in the world. You don't act like, I'm never going to go to work because they're heathens. You know what I'm saying? You know, Paul said, well, the only way you're going to escape that is die. Because this world order is ruled by Satan. And But you can learn to walk in any situation in Christ. But you've got to find the Word of God and you've got to begin to to meditate on that word and ask the Holy Spirit to begin to enlighten your eyes. And as you begin to meditate on that word, what he begins to do is that same operation that happened in your spirit, he begins to operate it in your soul. He begins to change and cleanse and, and, and condition your soul to be able to come in oneness with him. Because where our battles are usually lost is our soul and our spirit are separated. They're fighting one another. The spirit fights the flesh and the flesh fights the spirit. And it constantly goes on in your life. Paul said, those things that I want to do, I don't. Those things that I don't want to do, I do. But how do I stop it through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yeah, that changed my spirit, but it didn't change my natural man. It didn't change my natural circumstances. It didn't change my life here on this earth. So he allows you through the process of renewing your mind through the word of God. He begins to take that spiritual operation and he begins to change your thoughts into thinking like he thinks. And to look at the way things that he looks at it. Are you following me? But it takes process. You start out as a child. You turn into a youth. And then you become an adult. Listen, and I'll close. I lied, didn't I? Well, here's the last thought. I'm not coming back. He's a liar. <laughs> In 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 2, <laughs> I write unto you, verse 13, you fathers, because you have known me. I write unto you, young, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Just knowing the Father isn't going to change your circumstances, your condition. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. 
I write unto you, young man, youth, because you're strong and the Word of God abides in you. I'll open this up next week, but I'll close it here. When you can take the Word of God and begin to change your character, who you want to be in Him, or you can change your condition and it begins to change, you're just entering the youth of your spiritual life. If you constantly allow the enemy to make a mountain come into your life, the same mountain over and over and over. Yeah, you know God's your father. But God wants you to grow up and take his sword of the spirit, take his word, and get that wicked one under your feet. Let me put it in the natural. Man, you guys got to quit drawing on me so I can shut down here. What's it like in the natural? Could you imagine Law back here, Laura? And she said, Danny, I'm almost 40. Could you come back here and burp me? Can you change my diaper? Whoa. You know what I'm saying? Whoa. Whew. What happened to growing up in youth? You ever notice at youth they change? I'm not going to do that, Mom. What? <laughs> There's something about growing up. But we haven't been taught. There's a, there's a spiritual growing up in the, in the spirit realm. When you begin to enter into the youth, you begin to renew your mind with the word of God. And you start to see the way God sees it. And you say, you know what? Devil, I'm done with you. Mountain, I'm done with you. You're under my feet. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, that I didn't get very far, but it's okay. Because this is important. There's so many Christians today in this world that has lost so many battles. Yeah, they know God is their father. Yeah, he, he is their father. But it's our responsibility to get the wicked one under our feet. God can't help you in certain cir circumstances. He wants you to help yourself and learn to have victory through the word of God. And the Spirit of God says to my spirit to teach them, show them this truth. I've given you a lot. I just deposited it in your spirit. You know what I want you to say, so I want you to speak it. And I speak to the congregation. I want you to hear. Have ears to hear for now and from this day forth. You can begin to have victory and triumph in your life. You don't have to be squashed under mountains and squeezed and put under and look embarrassed and disgraced and feel foolish. You take my word and begin to apply it in every circumstance. I will change those conditions. I will change the character of that situation. You will begin to win. You will win. I have never lost a battle and I've never been defeated. And I'll show you. Be of good comfort. As I have overcome the world, so will you. You will begin to take the mountains that have tried to destroy your life over and over. They speak to you and they come to you. You almost fear them. You almost intimidate. You hate when they come, but now you'll face that mountain. You'll speak to that mountain. You'll cast that mountain into the sea, and it will be gone. You'll begin to walk as a man or a man that I've created to be, to walk in the Spirit, to walk by the Word of God, and to walk by the wisdom and power of God. I want to empower you for coming into a strong court. We're coming into the last race. We're coming into the last round. We're in the relay. We're coming around. You have to understand that at the end of days, Satan will rage. He knows his hour is coming. But I want you to know you can rise up in a strength and a power that's not of you but of me. And I will show you how to rise up in it and walk in it and never be defeated. I will show you that the failures are just speed bumps. Get over those, those speed bumps. Take authority and walk on. I will show you how to walk above your circumstances and live above those things. Because I've created you to be a new creature. Old things are past away, all things have become. You've got to quit seeing yourself in the flesh and your failures and your mistakes and your past. You've got to let that wash under the blood of Jesus that I've forgiven you. Forgive yourself. Don't speak those things over your life because I will never, ever, ever speak them over your life because I have taken them and cast them to the side. I don't speak them over your life. you got to quit putting them in your mouth and talking about your past. It's gone. It's, 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 it's washed under the blood of Jesus. You're clean. No, now to get a hold of the Word of God and begin to replace those things you spoke over your life with my Word. Remember, my Word is your spirit. It's your offense and defense. You need to begin to walk and be quickened by my life through the Word of God. And you will begin to see a change in your condition. You'll begin to see a change in your marriage. You'll begin to see a change in your family. You'll begin to see a change on your job in every aspect of your life. I will show you how to deal and live in every aspect of your life. I've called you to great things, but you can't see them. 
How can I show you spiritual things when you can't see earthly things? Know this, that I love you, that I've died for you, and I would do it again. But know this, that I've provided you everything that you need. Know that inside the word will release that wisdom and power that's been sealed in your spirit, and it will bubble up into the everlasting life. Know that inside of you, you are great, you're a giant, you're a winner, you're triumphant. Know this and understand this and get a hold of it. For the hours will become darkened, but you will be the light. And as the light, you will shine. And as you shine, people will be drawn to you and ask you why you're different. And at that moment, I will quicken you. I will anoint you and you will speak. I will put my word in your mouth and you will know exactly what to say because I've filled your mouth. Know that I'm bringing open doors into your life. I'm creating a path that you will walk in. Things will begin to change and you will see it and you will know it. So I say, thank you, Lord. I'm going to cut it off. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. For the Lord is good and His mercy endure. For the Lord is good and His mercy endure. For the Lord is good and His mercy endure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.